And, um, I'm just uh, privileged, all of us are privileged to have the incredible core of academic advisors we have in the College of Science and Math. And so, uh, Ms. Yarborough will announce the f some of the first group of freshmen. Beth? Samantha Bell. Victoria Bennis. Catherine Bennett. Chelsea Barra. Jennifer Bezak. Is she here? No. James Blankenship. Jenna Blomer. Sean Bowman. Eric Brush. Abigail Camaletti. Kristen Carr. Laura Cawthon. Sun Chang. Jacqueline Chivers. Bliss Cook. Emily Cortman. Caitlin Crow. Christopher Cunningham. Stephen Darby. Ellen Davies. Joe Dennison. Joy DeShazo. Chelsea Dodd. Rebecca Duran. Michael Evans. Lola Fisher. Melissa Ford. Okay, uh, uh, we're going to continue this in just a minute, but before we do that, uh, freshmen, really all the rest of the freshmen, if you would just now uh, go up along the wall and go out that way, we'll get you lined up too. So N through Z, N through Z, just make your way in that direction. Next advisor will be calling her names is Ms. Krista Deal. Again, a great advisor. One of the things she's done in our unit is kind of taken us to the next step in terms of uh, technology and advising. So she's made up uh, some podcasts which uh, students can listen to that talks about advising policy and some things that they may want to know. So let me present to you Ms. Krista Deal. Catherine Garber, Christine F. Garrett, Mary Catherine Gentry, Nathaniel M. Gill, Kevin A. Gilmore, Kelly A. Gilrith, J. Nathan Gray, Kristen E. Gay, R. Ashley Ham, Caitlin B. Harper, Chelsea E. Harvey, Natalie R. Hauser, Stead L. Hayes, Mary K. Herrick, Catherine M. Hester, Lauren M. Higgins, Megan L. Hill, Zachary S. Hubbard, Zach G. Keenum, Carolyn R. Kenimer, Helena Kaniwan, Ballard L. Lander, Jennifer L. Lewis, Frank E. Bert Litchfield, Stephen Leo, Kelly S. 
Lynn, Pamela S. Martin, Brandon L. Mason, Mary E. McCloskey, Amanda L. McKinney, Sarah B. Milberger, Julie A. Minnell, Michaela P. Morrissey, Elizabeth C. Mosley. A lot of our students in the College of Science and Math are in the pre-health professions. Uh, Ms. Beverly Childress is the director of the pre-health professions and her job is to do whatever she can to make Auburn students more competitive in getting into the uh, professional health schools like med school, dental school, and whatever. She doesn't work in the courses but does all the other stuff, shepherding them through the application process and provides an incredible service to Auburn students. I'm pleased that she'll be presenting this next group of students. Ms. Childress. Gabrielle M. Navia. Cameron D. Owens. Kevin M. Reed. Charles R. Rem, Moses Rivera, Megan L. Roberts, Casey L. Ruark, Timothy D. Shorkoff, Mary Lauren Sharp, Joseph M. Shaw, Ashlyn B. Smith, Lauren S. Smith, Carter S. Tisdale, Ferdas B. Torbenajad, Carol A. Troy, Christopher W. Tufts, William A. Wallach, James K. Westermark, Tatiana M. Wiggum, Ashley A. Williamson, William C. Wilson, Mark S. Wernel, Clifford P. Wood, Jonathan E. Weibel, Daniel W. Yates, Bradley L. Young, Kevin J. Zhang. Wow. Unbelievable. I, don't, I lost count as they were coming across the stage. But I want to give all of them another round of applause for the work they're doing. I would like to ask, we're going to move to recognizing a couple of graduate teaching assistants and two faculty members. So if they would come forward and sit up here, uh, I'd appreciate it. I want you to... Uh, there's another group that's been up here already, but I want to recognize the, uh, this group. This, these are COSAM advisors. They were here and they introduced your students for their 
awards, but this is a very special group. These are the ones that sort of bridge between the classroom, the, the home, and university life. And I, I'm just so grateful and blessed that COSAM has such wonderful group of advisors. Of course, they're experts in the curriculum. But you know, a student will come to their office and curriculum matters can be taken care of maybe in five minutes. It's the other 25 minutes that our advisors tirelessly devote to the student who's come to their office. They are mentors, they are parents, because their, their parents are someplace else. They are social workers, because the transition between 17 and 18 years old is enormous. But that transition doesn't stop, does it? I mean, they go from 19 to 20, 21, so, I mean, so the mentoring takes place throughout that. They're friends. They are nurses, right? They are diplomats. And I just want you as a group to have heard me stated that as the Dean of the College of Science and Mathematics. And I'd like for you to join me in acknowledging the COSAM advisors who I think play a significant role in your student's life. And if they'll stand up, we can recognize them. Okay, I'd like to recognize two graduate teaching assistants. These are individuals who are close to the students. They're between the faculty and the undergraduate student and serve a major role in expediting, facilitating, and nurturing the educational career of our students. So the first of these I'd like to recognize is Larissa Parsley. Larissa, if you'll come forward and stand up here. The, the two GTAs will receive a certificate and uh, $250. So that must be a parent. Uh, Larissa is a graduate student in the Department of Biological Sciences, where she is completing her PhD under the direction of Dr. Mark Lyles. L Larissa began teaching as an undergraduate at William Carey University. There she was employed as an undergraduate teaching assistant in general biology and general microbiology. Since being at Auburn, she has effectively taught in five different upper level microbiology and immunology courses. In his letter of support, Dr. Lyles reported that Larissa's record as a GTA has been stellar. She, con she, consistently, she has consistently been a GTA that students felt they could turn to to help them understand the material. She frequently goes beyond what is expected of a GTA. For example, she once did a lab demonstration that took her two days to prepare, but also one that contributed significantly to the laboratory experience of her students. Departmental faculty member Dr. Catherine McVeigh indicated that Larissa's enthusiasm and love for science and learning make her a great teacher. She teaches students with respect. That's the key word, isn't it? She teaches students with respect and is always willing to go the extra mile in explaining concepts. A couple of comments from students. Larissa, Larissa is by far the best GTA I have had at Auburn. She is extremely knowledgeable and helpful. Without her assistance, I would have been lost most of the time. She is extremely personable and professional. She takes her job very seriously and is approachable when students need help. Approachable is also a key word. So Larissa, I'm certainly pleased to present to you a 2010 COSAM GTA Award for your efforts. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Laura McCulley. Laura is a graduate student. 
in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, where she is completing her PhD under the direction of Dr. Chris Roger. Laura has taught a wide array of mathematics courses to a diverse group of audiences, including Auburn students in calculus, finite mathematics and statistics, high school students in our GK-12 program, and public school teachers in, team, in the Team Math Project. In every case, she has distinguished herself as an outstanding teacher. In his letter of support, Departmental Chair Dr. Smith reported that Laura was an excellent and popular teacher who has a great commitment to her classes. He even related an incident where you had been injured, but that didn't stop you from making it to your class and performing exceptionally well. Dr. Roger indicated that her students love her. He a quote from Dr. Roger, at the end of spring semester, most of her classes begged her to be assigned to the sequel calculus class so that they could be in her class again. She likes to talk about teaching issues with me, always looking for ways to improve. There is nothing she wouldn't do for her students, Dr. Roger reported. Let me comment from, give you some comments from your students. No, they're, you're okay. <laughs> calculus was a great way to start my day. That's gotta be good. What time was that? What time was that class? It was probably like 9 a.m. 9 a.m., well, that's pretty good. Uh, <clears throat> because it was fun, and I was able to understand it. Although I was a little intimidated at first, but her teaching style very quickly put my mind at ease. Her every, day, uh, every day her class was an exciting learning experience. I failed calculus for the first time. This time I'm actually doing well. <laughs> it doesn't say who was the first time. I was going to say, tell me they learned something. <laughs> One other, a very clear, funny, engaging, eloquent, but overall she likes teaching and knows her subject well. I really enjoyed her and learned a lot. Laura, congratulations. Those are wonderful statements in support of you. Faculty, that's where it all starts. We can build buildings, we can build parking lots, we can make big football stadiums, but it's all about faculty. It's faculty that make the university what it is. It's really a build it and they will come, and the build it is faculty. And so I'm pleased to recognize two faculty members at this time. Each year we give an outstanding faculty advisor award. And I'd like for Dr. Narinda Goval to come forward. Dr. Goval is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. He's been in Auburn since 1983. As the undergraduate program officer for his department, Dr. Goval directly advises more than 40 students and coordinates the advising of all other undergraduates in the department. While reflecting on his advising, Dr. Goval said, quote, I usually stay late in my office and welcome students at any time, even after office hours. This way I'm able to accommodate those students seeking advice at a time convenient to them. Good for you. I've always enjoyed talking to students and helping them resolve their problems. Your department chair, Dr. Michelle Smith, reported that Dr. Goble has restructured the entire undergraduate advising program in the department to better serve the students' needs. One of Dr. Goble's colleagues indicated the selection committee that, to the selection committee that the most impressive part of his advising efforts are the things he has done for our undergraduate program over the past year. It had stood somewhat dormant and in the need of serious overhaul, but Narendra has done that with skill and boundless energy. A student reported that Dr. Goble's willingness to extend a helping hand to others makes him one of the most respected faculty members in the department. He is almost available at any time to discuss the problems that occur on the academic and personal level. And finally, another student indicated that Dr. Goval played a major role in helping me choose a career in mathematics. 
Under his tutelage, I have been motivated to strive for exceptionally high standards. So, Dr. Goble, I'm pleased to present you with a certificate and a check for $1,000 for the respect and attention you're giving the students. I should have mentioned COSAM, uh, COSAM gets four faculty awards a year. We give a research faculty award, we give an advising faculty award, we give an outreach faculty award. The research and outreach are done at other times, and we also give a teaching award. The teaching award uh, each year is presented at this time, and I'd like for Dr. Holly Ellis to come forward. Dr. Ellis is an, is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. She came to Auburn in 2001, and almost since her arrival, she has been recognized as a gifted teacher. I like her teaching philosophy because she has put it to practice. And I quote, a successful instructor should be able to inspire and challenge, and challenge those students whose initial motiva motivation for taking the course may have been born out of necessity. My approach to the classroom is to re relate biochemical processes to applied problems. In order to make students aware that I am concerned about their individual success, I make a point to learn the names of all of the students in my class, which can reach 160 students. Department Chair Dr. Vince Ortiz noted that direct observation of her lectures leaves no doubt that her teaching is consistently excellent. Students regularly ask me to schedule Dr. Ellis for their next course in biochemistry. Dr. Marie Wooten supported Dr. Ellis' nomination by informing the selection committee that, Dr. That, that Holly also takes a large number of undergraduate students in her laboratory and provides effective one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Students comment, in, as a few students comments, Holly, I've taken four years of sciences and she is as good as you could ask for. Yes, it is hard for chemistry to be appealing to me, but she made it happen. <laughs> Her thought-provoking questions throughout the lecture helped me understand complex, compl complex concepts. The class required me to think and to apply what I learned to many different areas. And I should also conclude that one of the top recognitions that the National Science Foundation can give a, a young faculty member is a career award. They're very competitive, but their the honors are uh, the honor is very very significant. And I should add that Dr. Ellis is an NSF career awardee. So Holly, I'm pleased to recognize you as COSAM's outstanding teacher for 2010. And the example that you're setting for all of us is much appreciated. Okay, a uh, few more things. Uh, I need for your help to acknowledge this lady that's been sitting up front here for two hours. This is Glenelg Lindsay, and she's the one that put all these names together, uh, helped Dr. Witt and the rest of us with our binders and everything. I'm gonna let her go down there. A few more things. Um, there are uh, students to be recognized at other ceremonies that we won't recognize today. You have them in your uh, program uh, booklet. President's Awards, Dan Mazzaferro, Student Government Association Award, Patrick Llewellyn, Colmer Biological Sciences Awards is Jessica Williams, and Colmer Physical Sciences is Evan Everett. The Col two Colmer Awards have been given for about 80 years. And so there's a long ch uh, chain of previous awardees for that. Uh, we've been talking about students. And COSAM has a group of students that serve us in many, many capacities. These are our COSAM leaders. And I'd like for them to stand up there down front. And I want you to help me recognize this wonderful group of students.
Are there any past leaders here? How about past deans medalists? Any past deans medalists here? Thought maybe it might be in graduate school or? Okay, come back. Um, okay, the, the awardees are going to help me with something. And you're going to help me because there are, there are parents, or there are family members, or there are friends who are here. And I'm going to ask those people to stand. And the wardies and I are going to thank that group of people. So how about parents, family, friends, whoever, have you stand up? Now, student, OK, students, help me, help me thank you. We want to thank you for sharing these people, these young people with us. We know that you leave with us your most valuable possessions. And we take that seriously. When I interview faculty members who would be, uh, become fac who I interview candidates for faculty positions in COSAM, I of course talk to them about their specialty. But I also ask some questions about how empathetic they might be toward a young person coming to Auburn and being in COSAM. And that fits into my recommendation back to the department, because that's a priority. We know that you have left us with your most valuable possession, and we appreciate the confidence you have in us and sharing that young person with us. There is a family day picnic tomorrow at 11.30 that I want to tell you about. It's in the COSAM quadrangle. It's near our two-story building, I think, and I we would certainly like to see you there. I have a couple of more, uh, one more thing to say to you. I have to check my notes to make sure I've got everything covered. Uh, I usually like to complete this with a few comments from myself. Some of the last time I'll see, I'll see when you go across the stage and graduate. But it seemed like every year I go back to one of my favorite topics. I guess it's because I've depended on it a lot, and that's imagination. I always, I, somehow when I think of what I'm going to talk about, I come back with imagination. And I thought, well, everything's got a small little eye in front of it today, right? And so we could have a little small eye and find it, follow it with imagination. Uh, and I also like to read Thomas Friedman. Thomas Friedman writes twice a week in the New York Times. He's an op-ed writer for the New York Times. He's also the author of The World is Flat, and also more recently, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. And he visited our campus about three years ago, two or three years ago, and we half filled Beard Eves for his lecture. And it was a lecture that COSAM participated in sponsoring, and perhaps that's why I'm still, I still gravitate towards Thomas Friedman's lectures. Jim Bradley's sitting over here and uh, helped bring Thomas Friedman to our campus. I want to quote from one of his op-eds on March 21, 2010. And I want you to insert, I'm, since I'm quoting directly from Friedman, uh, I want you to insert, when he talks about economic, I want you to put in there whatever it is that's driving you in your career. So I quote from Friedman now, in today's wired world, wired meaning W-I-R-E-D, not weird, wired world, the most important economic competition is no longer between countries and companies. The most important economic competition is actually between you and your own imagination. Because what your kids imagine, or what you imagine, they can now act on farther, faster, cheaper than ever before as individuals. Today, just about everything is becoming a commodity, except imagination, except the ability to spark new ideas. OK, now, let's go on with for even a little bit more, because it helps me get to my point. If you have just the spark of an idea now, I can get a designer in Taiwan to design it. I can get a factory in China to produce a prototype. I can get a factory in Vietnam to mass, mass manufacture it. I can use Amazon.com to handle fulfillment. I can use Freelancer.com to find someone to do my logo and manage my back room. 
And I can do all of this at incredibly low prices. The one thing that is not a commodity and will never be is that spark of an idea. Now, you, you students can, you can be a sparkler. You can be a sparkler. Let me tell you about Nicholas Christensen. Now, I, I've, this is, I'm leaving um, Friedman now. But you can be a sparkler is where my comments pick up. Nicholas is a senior at Wetumpka High School in Wetumpka, Alabama. Some of you may have been students at Wetumpka, may know Nicholas. Nicholas has participated in one of COSAM's outreach programs. We have a very extensive K-12 science and math outreach program. And he's done that for several years, including our best robotics competition. Nicholas has a hearing loss. But he imagined that he could develop a device for cell phones that would make them available to the hearing impaired and bring those individuals into a social phenomenon of the 21st century, and that is to be able to use a cell phone. He presented this idea at the Auburn Intel Science and Engineering Fair and won the greater East Alabama region. We sent him then to the Intel International Competition in Reno, Nevada, where he placed second in the computer science division, winning over other 1,500 other entries. There was two million started in that category that were winnowed down that were, came to Reno. So if you do the math, put, he was second over two million. There's now a patent pending. He's still a student at Wetumpka. There's now a patent pending for Nicholas's invention, and his imagination has become a reality. Okay, what are, what are the ingredients as I thought about Nicholas's accomplishment? I've not had the chance to meet him, but I have, I've talked to Mary Lou Ewald, who is our outreach director, who has had direct contact with Nicholas. And she relayed to me, and I summarized, that, that his imagination really opened up his creative thinking. And creative, creativity is thinking and analyzing and exploring and discovering and taking risks. It's okay to take a risk. It's really okay to do that. Okay, if we want to move our imagination and our creativity forward a little bit, we need some intuition or hunches. Right? I have a hunch. Actually, intuition and imagination, I find them buddies. Because, and I, I do a lot of imagination, and I'll finish up by telling you about something I imagined. But I do a lot of imagination, but I find that it has a lot to do with intuition, too. <laughs> they're, really, they're really the same thing. Okay, follow them and see where they will take you. Turn off your iPod. Okay? Because the brain can only do one thing at a time. And you got to listen to your imagination. You got to listen to that voice inside of you, right? Okay. The brain can only do one thing at a time, and it doesn't like to be distracted. So follow your that. But most likely, if you do that, you will not have fulfillment, and you will feel incomplete. Well, maybe that's because you're not following the right hunch. But don't be disappointed if you're not satisfied. That drive is there to keep you going. Michelangelo was going to point, was going to paint on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel regardless of what his mother said, right? You're going to do what? Well, I mean, he was just driven to do it. So each one of us has a spark inside of us. And sometimes you have to stop, take time, and listen to it. Slow down and listen to that, what's going on. Because that part of the drive is what keeps you going. You can look beyond yourself and see what others have done to deploy, to deploy their imagination. And it's okay to imitate. After all, aspiring artists first learn to paint by copying the masters. We heard about students who were up here doing undergraduate research. You don't, you're not born knowing how to do research. Now, the drive inside of you might be curiosity. But somebody has to show you. 
Somebody had to show people how to paint on cave walls. But they were driven to leave a message behind for all of us. Science research is all about building on what came before. So imitation is part of exploring what your talents are. You imitate, ah, that doesn't feel right. You imitate a little more, yeah, it's beginning to feel right. So you're starting to find the direction you should go. Hypotheses, you have to have a hypothesis, don't you? You have to have something that you're going to question. Arise from blending what you know, and that is sharpened by failures. You are all outstanding students. And it's not if I might fail, it's when I will fail. There's nothing wrong with that because you're sharpening your skills. You're learning who you are. You're learning what it is that I should be doing. We all get frustrated with failure, don't we? But in hindsight, you get back away from it, go for a walk. Best way to, the best way to, for me, maybe not you, to disconnect from failure is to go for a walk, to get out there and where it's just me and nature. Maybe some of you have other ways of doing that. Certainly understand that. But hypotheses arrive from blending with what others have done before you and provide the foundation for developing here the next important one, your confidence. Don't let frustration in following what's driving you help uh, cause you to lose confidence. Stay connected. Talk to a confidence. Don't talk to somebody who's close to you. That helps a lot too, doesn't it? Good listeners. I think intuition helps us sometimes be a good listener. Well, what's bothering you? I'd like to know about it too, because I might learn. Okay, so you develop confidence and, and that, hey, that helps you take a risk and bring forth your ideas. It isn't long before the other little I comes in, that's inspiration, eureka, light bulb. However you, however you define it. Curves and passion is refueled, and you're ready to go again. You're driven to complete the task if for no other reason, because you have an unfilled imagination. You know it. <laughs> if you take time to listen, you'll know it's unfulfilled. All of you are driven, and that's great. You've got a, you got a, a task to take. But you know, there's another, as I'm sitting here listening to all of these awards that these students have given, um, oh, and I must say, I must say this too. If you're not following this drive that you have, if you don't dream, dreams don't come true, right? Dr. King told us that 40 years ago, 50 years ago. If you don't dream, dreams don't come true. And if you don't follow that dream, you're going to feel irresponsible to yourself. That's no fun. I was like that. But also as I listened up here, you're driven by benefiting other people. Almost to a faculty member who spoke about the students, spoke about what they have given back. And you know, that's an Auburn way. I've been an Auburn, I'm not an Auburn graduate, but I've been in Auburn a number of years and I have found that's the Auburn way. And so part of your imagination is how can I help somebody else? And there's a lot of fulfillment in that as, as some of you know. How many artists would paint if they couldn't show their paintings to someone? Probably not many. How many composers would write music if there's no one to listen to it? So you want to share your imagination that results in talent. Can imagination be taught? Not really. We all have it. I think I first came in contact with it, nursery rhymes. For television, I, we didn't have television. My parents had a black and white television. And let me tell you, it was a little thing like that in a huge box. So they read to me. And I could imagine what they're reading to me. And I think that's where I developed it. I was also very much interested in radio. So I could listen to stations far away and imagine what it was like in Ukraine or someplace. But it can be nurtured and by taking time, by taking your time to visit with it. Let me tell you about something I imagined. I recall a COSAM student recognition event in 1995. 
when we honored no more than 10 students in a room in Foy Union, probably the size of this platform. And we honored one faculty member. I imagine many more students reaching that same level of accomplishment. Now look around you, and this year, COSAM has seen a student sitting where you're sitting who was recognized as a Rhodes Scholar. And also, I see a room filled with students with the same desires, passion, and abilities to reach that same level. And so imagination, see, really has, has been meaningful for me. So I'll bring these comments to a close. This is kind of a personal thing I wanted to pass along to you. Imagination is my favorite, favorite thing for you to nurture. And I do tell you there's so many distractions out there today. Take a break from those and get caught up with yourself. So catch the spirit of imagination in all of us and use it. So thank you for being here today. Those who are the juniors, sophomores, and freshmen, you got to be back here next year. Sustaining is part of it. And then strive to be a dean's medalist so you hang in our student services area and you can inspire us every day. So on behalf of COSAM and my colleagues, thanks for being here and best wishes to all of you. Keep up the good work and thank you.